nice to be here. Thank you so much, Lena. And Lena is an interpreter and teacher and nature and city guide from Tallinn in Estonia. And Lena also works in Brussels. And it's just wonderful to be with you here tonight, Lena. She's going to be telling us more about what's happening to forests in Estonia. We're also going to be hearing about what's happening in the southern USA. And we're delighted that Belinda Joyner is with us here tonight from North Carolina. Belinda, would you like to say hello? Hi, everybody, and especially to Pris from North Carolina for your support. And I see another name, Belinda Lambert. So hi, Belinda. I'm looking forward to just being here and glad to be here. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you, Belinda. Belinda is an incredible community campaigner and environmental activist from North Carolina. And we're going to be hearing more about what's happening to forests in the southern USA and how they're connected to the UK. And we also are joined tonight by a wonderful speaker from Canada, Michelle Connolly, who is a campaigner with Conservation North in British Columbia. Michelle, would you like to say hello? Hello, everybody. I'm Michelle Connolly, and uh, it's a real privilege to be speaking to you all today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. And we're delighted that Laura DeHennan from the climate charity Hope for the Future is also with us today. And Laura is going to be telling us more about an exciting event happening on Monday and how we can get involved in talking to our MPs. Laura, would you like to say hello? Yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for having me. Um, I'm not based anywhere as exciting as Belinda, Michelle or Lena. I'm near Liverpool. Um, so I lead our work in the north of England and Scotland at Hope for the Future. Um, I'm looking forward to telling you more about getting involved. Thank you so much, Laura. So our plan for this evening is I'm going to give a brief introduction to why we're talking about forests in Estonia, the southern US and Canada and how they're connected to the UK and to the biomass industry here in the UK. And then we're going to hear from our wonderful speakers. And we're also going to be talking about how we can take action and how we can get our MPs involved in doing more to protect forests. And there are lots of exciting things coming up. I'm sure you're aware that we're just six weeks away from COP26 and there's a key opportunity for us to take action as we prepare for COP. So to begin with tonight, I'm going to try sharing my screen. And I'm just going to give you a brief introduction to the biomass industry here in the UK. So we're thinking about how we can take action to protect forest climate and also wildlife and people. And first of all, what is the biomass industry all about? What is biomass burning? Well, it's basically taking organic material like wood, turning it into small pellets, and then burning that wood to make energy in power stations. And according to the biomass industry, burning wood is a clean, green, and renewable alternative to burning fossil fuels. And many power stations in the UK and also in Europe are converting from burning coal to burning wood instead. But what's actually happening is that beautiful biodiverse forests around the world, like this one in the southern USA that we can see on the left, are being cut down, turned into pellets, and then burned in power stations, especially here in the UK. And the UK government gives subsidies to biomass companies to burn wood. The UK is now the top subsidizer of biomass burning in Europe. And it's especially happening in a power station in the north of England in Yorkshire called Drax. Drax is based in Selby near York, and it was built in the 1970s as a coal power station. And since 2003, Drax has been burning both coal and wood. It's moving away from burning coal now, and it's almost exclusively burning wood. Drax is actually the biggest biomass burner in the entire world. It is also the UK's single largest carbon emitter. And in 2020, Drax emitted over 13 million tonnes of CO2 from burning 7 million tonnes of wood. And much of the wood that Drax burns is imported and it comes from clear felled forests in Estonia, Latvia, the southern USA and Canada. And we're going to be hearing more 
from Lena in a moment about these beautiful forests in Estonia that are currently under threat from the biomass industry. And there was also a really good news report on Channel 4 News about some of the wildlife and the people who are threatened by this industry. And these forests are home to lots of endangered species like flying squirrels and capricales. So we're going to be hearing more from Lena in a moment. We're also going to be hearing from Belinda about one of the areas that is worst impacted by the UK biomass industry, and that's the southeastern USA. The forests in this area in states like North and South Carolina and Georgia and Mississippi are at the heart of a global biodiversity hotspot. They're home to many rare and endangered species, including the Venus flytrap, salamanders, black bears, and many species of birds. They're also crucial in protecting people. The wetland forests protect local communities from flooding, from extreme weather, and from the worst impacts of the climate crisis. But they're currently the main sourcing area for wood to burn in UK power stations like Drax. And we're going to be hearing about a company called Enviva, which is the world's biggest wood pellet producer and a main supplier of wood pellets from the USA to Drax. And then Michelle is going to be telling us more about what is happening in Canada. Earlier this year, a wood pellet company called Pinnacle, which is based in Canada, was bought by Drax. And there is now a huge threat to some of the last remaining primary forests in Canada. And these forests are home to many rare and endangered species, including threatened caribou. And Michelle is going to be telling us more about what we can do to help protect Canadian forests. So while Drax is claiming that it is powering tomorrow with its so-called sustainable biomass burning, and while Drax is saying it's enabling a zero carbon, lower cost energy future, what Drax is actually doing is burning trees. And we can see from the top picture, the devastation to these biodiverse forests from the logging industry to supply wood to burn in power stations like Drax. And Drax currently gets over £2 million every single day in UK renewable subsidies to burn wood. And these subsidies are paid for through our energy bills here in the UK. We all have to pay a surcharge to fund biomass subsidies. And so what, we can, what we're going to find out about later is that we can actually transfer these subsidies away from biomass burning to genuine renewables like wind and solar power. And that's what we need to do to help protect forests. But at the moment, the biomass subsidies from the UK government are causing a disaster for forests around the world. They're harming wildlife, they're threatening communities who are suffering, and they're also making the climate crisis worse. Earlier this year, over 500 scientists wrote a letter to President Biden, to Ursula von der Leyen and to other world leaders, urging them to end subsidies for biomass burning because of the terrible impact biomass, the biomass industry is having on the climate. And this is a quote from the letter. As numerous studies have shown, this burning of wood will increase warming for decades to centuries. That is true even when the wood replaces coal, oil or natural gas. Government subsidies for burning wood create a double climate problem because this false solution is replacing real carbon reductions. Companies are shifting fossil energy use to wood, which increases warming, as a substitute for shifting to solar and wind, which would truly decrease warming. So that's the bad news, but the good news is there are lots of things we can do to help protect our forests. And we're going to be hearing about more of them from Michelle, from Lena and from Belinda. And a key thing we're going to be hearing about later is how we can take action through the Cut Carbon Not Forests campaign to ask our MPs to end the subsidies for biomass burning and transfer them to wind and solar power. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm delighted to welcome Lena Steinberg from Estonia, who's going to tell us more about what's happening there and how we can take action to help. The title of my presentation is then Forest Biomass from Estonia, is it green and sustainable? Might have that question. At first, um, I'm sure you can put Estonia on the map 
more or less, but uh, uh, just to repeat and mention, we are in the northeastern part of Europe, and we are the northernmost of the three Baltic states, having then borders to Finland in north, Russia in east, Latvia in south, and Sweden oversea in uh, west. So I represent here Save Estonia's forests, and I'm a member of board of that NGO. So very shortly about us, we are only one and a half years old, uh, one of the two NGOs uh, covering uh, the whole of Estonia when it comes to forest protection, and we are run by women. Uh, just a coincidence, there are more of us, but on the picture you can see uh, four of us. We are from very different walks of life. We focus on um, awareness raising in society as a whole, and also we uh, interact a lot with uh, decision makers, uh, politicians and uh, civil servants. We organize uh, peaceful demonstrations. Um, we cooperate with other NGOs, and we are recently, we have also become claimants in uh, different court cases. And uh, the coolest uh, demonstration we have organized was one year ago in August. Then we had a forest demonstration in 27 different locations in Estonia. So, and why do Estonian forests need savings? So there are different reasons for that. We have uh, two high logging volumes. Logging is allowed also in spring and summer during the breeding season of birds and animals. And our uh, forests, which should actually be protected and which are protected on paper, are not protected in reality. And that includes like old growth forests, valuable habitats, Natura 2000 forests, which is a special category in the EU, and sacred forests, eco corridors, and then also forests uh, very important to local uh, communities. And in order to reinforce uh, um, uh, the ban uh, of logging during uh, the breeding season in spring and summer, we have gone now to court together with BirdLife Estonia and the Estonian Wildlife Rescue Center. So, but, and what have been the results of um, all this excessive logging, this uh, malpractice? So a few examples, we have lost every fourth forest bird, also not every species, not every fourth species, but every fourth forest bird during the last decades. And most of the species in Estonian nature who are threatened live in forests. And we have uh, 11 different forest habitats in Estonia. We're a small country, but very diverse. And most of them are actually not in good conservation status. And people in Estonia, they see forest management as one of the main environmental problems. And it is influencing the mental health of people, especially the mental health of people who live uh, close to forests, which are uh, clear cut. That means uh, people who live in the countryside, in villages and in uh, smaller towns. So uh, I know that in Scotland, you have a lot of like forest therapy and forest bathing. Uh, in Estonia, it's partly uh, the opposite, that in areas which are excessively clear cut, people have forest stress. And how have we ended up uh, here? I would say that it's like uh, greed, combined with ignorance, uh, greed from the side of the intensive forest industry, and ignorance, uh, I'm sorry to say, on the side of uh, many decision makers. And um, well, a knowledge about forests and ecosystem is uh, lacking among politicians, at least in Estonia. Our prime minister, uh, Mrs. Kaya Kallas, for example, has said, and it's almost word to word translation here, a tree outgrows at some point, uh, right, and starts to rot. And then it em emits CO2 and so on, being itself harmful, harmful to the environment. Okay, and our Minister of Environment, who by the way has not finished uh, any uh, universities yet, says that wood pellets are better than wood rotting on forest floor. So of course, wood, as we know, does not rot, 
but decays, apples rot. And uh, Raul Kirjanen, the CEO of Granul Invest, which is one of the biggest pellet producers in the world, coming from Estonia, and who is the fourth richest man in Estonia, uh, says that when we when we cut uh, saw logs and veneer logs, then also a lot of other material comes out there, and such kind of material which is only good for making pellets. So this comes out is a narrative which is constantly repeated by the forest industry. Uh, for me, it sounds like the Lord of the Rings when trees really started to walk. So they were coming out of the forest, but actually uh, no trees come out themselves in real life, they are brought out uh, by the intensive industry. Oh, and by the way, on the photo, uh, you can see um, a birdhouse and you can see that the upper part of the tree where the birdhouse is uh, fixed on was cut. So every inch uh, was considered to be necessary. Uh, this photo is taken close to my second home in the countryside. And what's uh, the role of forest biomass in all this then? So um, the, increase, uh, the increase in logging volumes in Estonia has been in direct correlation uh, with the demand after wood pellets. I remember when I started to see trucks full of such kind of uh, trees, which uh, we call pencils, so small. And first we wondered, where are these trees going to? You can't build a log house of the, these trees. They're not even good as, as like normal firewood which you chop. And then like years later, we finally realized what kind of a pellet industry we have here. So it has been like growing gradually. And the main export markets for our wood pellets are then Denmark, uh, the UK and the Netherlands. And approximately 60% of our wood is burnt, mainly abroad as pellets, but also as firewood. And only 20% is uh, used for making pulp and paper and the other 20 to produce uh, furniture and log houses. So it, it varies a bit, so year to year, but these are the uh, approximate uh, percentages. And um, Sally already explained it about like drugs and uh, subsidies a little bit, but it really is so that you as taxpayers uh, pay your money and then uh, the politicians decide that it will go to, for example, drugs. Drugs will pay, let's say, Granul Invest, the Estonian company, good price for pellets. And then this company becomes uh, really wealthy and uh, they can uh, afford a lot of uh, PR, lobbying and um, they really with their messages and all the finances they have they have a real chance to influence not only uh, the politicians but also the public opinion by uh, buying advertisements in newspapers in media etc and why is um, the harvesting of forest biomass especially harmful uh, to the ecosystems so as I already said, um, almost everything is suitable for making pellets. So they take everything out, also such kind of small pencils. Uh, the photo here is taken by, by me in spring 2020. And so um, also oaks and acorns, which were like only 20 years old approximately, were also cut. So everything comes out, as they say. The intensive logging industry is often speaking about like scrap wood or some kind of waste wood and that they use only that and uh, that uh, quality uh, logs are used for something else but um, there is no such thing as scrap wood from the perspective of nature every tree growing are also dead trees uh, also weird and, and special trees there's somebody's home or somebody's food and of course um, when you log to make pellets, then you use heavy machinery and uh, you're not interested in close to nature forestry or also in other words, uh, continuous cover forestry. Uh, your MPs might ask you, okay, if we don't buy pellets from them, what are they gonna do with the forest? How do they earn their income? They need the money. Well, uh, we can also use our forest <laughs> differently. Uh, well, more 
It could be used for making uh, furniture and log houses and such kind of long lasting products. That's one thing. But if log less, it would be um, positive for biodiversity, climate protection, that's clear. And there are also a lot of alternative ways to earn money with forests. You don't have to cut trees. It's not so that only a dead tree is a useful tree. Um, nature tourism, nature cosmetics, um, uh, picking berries, mushrooms, uh, forest bathing, hiking, uh, etc. By the way, uh, did you know that Estonia is the land of 1,000 brown bears? It's really true. We have approximately the size of like Denmark or Netherlands or Switzerland, and we have 1,000 brown bears. So I would like to sell you uh, uh, the opportunity to come here and watch brown bears from a forest cabin and, and less pellets and wood. So, and what can people abroad uh, do to support us? Well, you can raise awareness, of course, among your decision makers and uh, in general public, tell our story, share what you uh, saw here today and what you heard here today. And uh, if you'd like to, then you can also ask us more questions later. And you could also support our NGOs financially, especially because of the court cases we are having. And by the way, on the picture here, you can see a flying squirrel. They only live in uh, Finland, Estonia, from EU countries, and then uh, further east also in, in Russia and elsewhere in Asia. So thank you so much. And um, there's more information about our NGO on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, on our webpage usually as well, but at the moment somebody has hacked it. I think we got on somebody's nerves or was it like ordinary hacking? Anyway, our webpage is down at the moment, savetheforest.de, but we will uh, try to get it up as quickly as possible, of course. And the last picture greeting you here is a uh, Tony Owl. So thank you. Thank you so much. That was absolutely wonderful, Lena. And if anyone has any questions for Lena, yes, John. One very simple question. When are we going to get proper accounting for the wood industry? What we've got is subsidies going to companies. And there's no accounts. In forests, way back in the Middle Ages, foresters maintained the forest. Why can't we get something like that again? Why should we have multinationals, billionaires, getting all sorts of money for failing trees, which are doing nothing but damage? Yes, um, I can only agree with that, of course. And what we saw taking place in Estonia in 1990s, after we regained our independence from the Soviet Union, was that the, uh, the industry lobbied politicians to change um, forestry laws. And uh, one of the first things they did was to get rid of the foresters, the ones who had, up until that time, kept an eye on the forests. So a lot of people became unemployed. And um, so here we go. Thank you so much, Luna. And as John was saying, we don't have very good carbon accounting rules at the moment. It's the biomass industry is called carbon neutral because it's assumed that new trees will grow in the future and absorb all the emissions that are produced by cutting down, transporting and burning trees today. So the key thing that we need to do, I know a lot of campaigners are working on trying to change that description of biomass as carbon neutral, but we also need to stop the subsidies that are fueling this terrible industry and get them into genuine renewables instead. Dorian is going to show us a video now to tell us about another area that is really suffering because of the UK biomass industry. And we're going to be hearing from Belinda in a moment or two after Dorian shows us this video. This is the southeastern USA, which is an incredible area for wetland forests. When anybody thinks of clean, green energy, this is not it. 
So at the very local level, you've got pollution, then span out a little bit and you've got large scale clear cutting. And then at the global level, you've got an industry that is burning these trees to generate electricity, making climate change worse. So yes, this is impacting all of us with disproportionate impacts to the people who live right next to the mill. There was a truck right there. There was no truck. That's what we heard all day and all night. This is a little small town, rural area, poor area. But ever since this plant been here, everybody's whole lives have changed. And the plant is right behind my house, right in my back door. And Viva is the world's largest producer of biomass. At its plant in Northampton, North Carolina, trees are processed into wood pellets and then shipped overseas. Once in Europe, the pellets are then burned as clean energy to generate electricity and power plants. And after the European Union classified biomass as a renewable energy source, the American South emerged as Europe's primary source of biomass. For some reason, the southeastern U.S. has been forgotten. It's almost like people living in these rural communities don't matter. This is a sacrifice zone. These wood pellets aren't even producing electricity here. We've seen a pattern of the wood pellet industry targeting low-income communities of color. Before the wood pellet industry even came in here, this rural community was struggling. Even though in this county, the majority of the population is black, 99% of the land in the rural South is owned by white people. So there is a very long history of perpetuating economic inequity. When you look at our communities and you see communities of color, and this is where it is, that we have these factories here that's polluting our air. They're cutting down all of our trees. We need these trees. No wonder we're dying. And then we don't have that opportunity, that privilege to get up and move when some comes and invade our territory. And then how many people want to move? Why should we when we've been here all our lives and we've worked hard to accumulate what we have? And then you come and sit in right dab in the middle of our community and think that we're supposed to be happy about it? Hell no. Mm -mm. And Viva says they choose facility locations based on access to wood, infrastructure and labor. So this forest that we're looking at right here is about 100 years old, and within a week it was gone, clear cut, turned into wood pellets. We know this went to Inviva because we followed the logging trucks with the cypress trees back to the Inviva plant. Inviva says they received about 25% of the trees from this tract. Once this wood is cut, they're being processed in these mills that are emitting massive amounts of pollution that are known to be hazardous to human health. The wood dust is fine particulate matter. When you breathe it in on a regular basis, it causes heart problems, it causes respiratory problems. It can lead to cancer. And Viva says the air quality levels found near the Northampton facility are within the federal limits and do not present a public health risk. Yeah, you can see it on, on the top of the hood. Look at this one. Everything that's in the yard getting dust on. I'm dealing with health issues with heart problems, congestion heart failure. And on top of that, I'm dealing with pressure on my lungs and don't know where, where it keep coming from. I had to wear a mask every day coming out here and this stuff, way before the COVID. I mean, sometimes my nose be bleeding and dust and stuff. It messes with my wife and my son asthma all the time. They don't even sit outside. It makes me angry because I don't know what I'm inhaling. When you go over to the wood pellet mill, you see the pollution coming out of the smokestack. That is not clean, that is not green. When it goes over to Europe and it's burned in a power station, it's emitting even more pollution, emitting more carbon than would have been coming out of the smokestacks if they had been burning coal. This is like a needle in a haystack in the southeastern U.S. This is an ancient cypress forest. There's very little of this left. It's just this incredible jewel of an ecosystem that very few people really understand exists here. I mean, this is a really special place. We're looking at trees around us that are over a thousand years old. And while the forestry industry and the wood pellet industry says that trees are renewable, we aren't renewing thousand-year-old ecosystems. You know, they're renewing forests for commercial production. 
North Carolina alone, the wood pellet industry is responsible for clearing 164 acres of forest a day, 60,000 acres a year. Files being in a poor area, what can we do with a company like that with money and we don't got money to fight against it? And it seems like we don't got no one fighting for us. I don't know what it's going to take, but something needs to be done about it. And Viva declined to be interviewed on camera for this story, but provided written statements to CNN. is an introduction to what is happening to incredible wetland forests in the southern USA and I'm absolutely thrilled that Belinda is with us this evening to tell us more about what's happening to forests and communities and wildlife in areas like North Carolina and how we can take action to help. It's a privilege that you're with us tonight Belinda. Belinda is an incredible community activist and forest protector and we're really looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks so much Belinda. Again, I thank you all for having me. Um, it's a privilege to speak to you all today. And as the term says, a picture is worth a thousand words. Pictures can say things that we can't. And when you look at those pictures, you can't deny what you see because it's there. And let me tell you a little bit about Northampton County. We are a tier one county, meaning that we are one of the poorest counties in the state of North Carolina. Uh, we're right off the I-95 corridor, so they say we're easy access to the highway. And Viva is about three miles from my home. And as you saw the gentleman that was in the film, um, Andre, he lives right, like I say, he's right in his backyard. And this is what they get 24 seven. The noise, the trucks, um, the debarker, um, the, the, the dust, they get it. And it's, it's, it's sad to say, just like you say, you know, and having someone to help or reach out to help is far between our leaders. Because when Enviva came here, uh, uh, economic developer uh, Gary Brown proposed that Enviva come here, um, our com county commissioners gave them more than what they should have gave, gave them as an incentive to come here. And because of that, uh, property taxes have gone up 6%. Now we are, like I say, poverty level, we're about 22% below poverty level, predominantly African-American. Um, and I use the term as dumping ground because this is where, if you look at all the in vivas and where they're located, they're in communities of color. Um, and I feel like that's a disadvantage because we are being taken advantage of. Um, our Chamber of Commerce this year, recognizing Viva as the, the company of the year. And to me, that was a total slap in the face because they talked about the things that Enviva supported, they supported this, but what are they doing for that gentleman that's right there at it? And the only thing that separates those people from Enviva is a chain link fence. So if they come on their front porch, they see a stack of logs, they see a stack of sawdust. There's nothing covering that sawdust from blowing because you could see the residue that was on his car. If it's on his car, that means it's on the ground. When you walk, you're tramping in it, you're taking it back in your home. He has respiratory problems. We don't know how many more people have it, but we do know that it's a cause of, it's a health problem. Um, when I look at Enviva, I look at it as profit over people. They're not concerned about what they're doing to the communities that they're in. Because if you go to Bethesda, Maryland, which is one of the richest counties there is in the state of Maryland, and look at the lavish skyscraper office that they have there. They're living large. They don't live in this community, so it doesn't bother them that we get the sawdust, that we get the noise, because they wouldn't have it in their community. So, like I say, they dump it here. Our DEQ and DAQ, which is the Department of Air Quality and um, Environmental uh, Agency, they always permit them. They just granted them a uh, Title V permit. Before that, they uh, granted them a permit to expand, which they're going to spend $45 million to expand. So with our property taxes going up, we are paying them basically to kill us. And being right off the I-95 corridor, 
they're not far from Virginia where they, they ship it out at, at Chesapeake, Virginia. They're about two hours away. So that truck or those trucks that take those pellets there to the port, they could make, I'd, I'd say in a, in, a, in a day's time, say from eight to five or whatever, they may be able to make three or four trips there in a day's time. And once that ship loads up and goes across the water, then you all are suffering because you're paying a subsidy tax. We are paying property taxes, but what are we benefiting from it? Again, I say profit over people. We were on a call yesterday and one lady in Sampson County said she actually saw a bear. She'd never seen a bear before, but she actually with her eyes saw a bear. That's because all the habitats are gone. The birds have no homes. The, the deer, the bear, they have no home because the trees are being cut down and they're saying replant. But how long does it take a tree to mature? We're looking at 15, 20 years for a tree to mature. In that time, what are we supposed to do? I look at Lumberton, North Carolina, where the Lumbee River is. I had never actually seen a flood zone with my natural eye. You know, when floods come, you see on the TV where areas are flooded. But I actually had the opportunity in 2019 to be in Lumberton, North Carolina and see where homes had flooded. And when you pass these homes, you see all the frontage and everything sitting out in the yard because of the flood and because of the Lumbee River where there, a lot of trees have been cut down um, and they don't have that, that support. But yet and still, when our government, when these big companies go in, um, they talk about the revenue that it will bring, but then what are you doing with the revenue? You're not helping the people that's being affected so, you know, like I say, it's profit over people and it's all about that money. They're not concerned that the bears have no habitat or that the birds don't have trees. They're not concerned about our oxygen because if they were, they wouldn't be cutting down the trees which absorb that carbon dioxide and, and let off oxygen um, to the point where, you know, we're not breathing or they talked about uh, COVID-19 being a great problem in the African-American community and the Hispanic community. This is why, because we have such things as these facilities sitting in our communities and we're breathing it in every day. And then they talk about underlying conditions. So if little Susie gets asthma, or if I get cancer, will Enviva pay for my hospital bills? The first thing they say, oh no, we're not responsible for that. We didn't cause that. They have an air monitor up at the high school, which is about, I would say three or four miles from Enviva. We have a hog farm, we have a paper mill, we have Enviva. So Who's to say where the pollution is coming from? How can you pinpoint and say this came from in vivo or that came from the hog farm? It's just there to say it's there. In other words, to more or less appease the people where we do have an air monitor, but why not put that air monitor where it needs to be at, which is maybe across the field from in vivo where it can collect what's coming from in vivo. And then you don't have to determine where it's coming from because you already know. So, you know, people are living these lavish lives. They're living in these beautiful homes. They would not allow for an in vivo plant to be within, I guess, 15 or 20 miles radius of where they live because it would devalue their property. It would make, you know, their community go down. So what about the people, like I say, what about myself? What about Andre and all those people that live right there at it? What are they doing to help the people? It's all right to give our frontline workers uh, contributions at this time, they need it. And I'm in support, full support of that. But then what are you doing, like I say, for the people that are being directly affected? He said he has heart problems, he can't breathe, he was wearing a mask even before COVID. Have they reached out to him and say, well, you know, I know you're right here at us, what can we do to help you? Or, or his aunt that lives in the back of him, she's 80 years old, well, past 80 now. And she uh, says she can't come out and work in her flowers because her nose constantly run. She doesn't sleep well at night because of the noise. Who's concerned about that? But there's studies saying that, you know, it's not hurting people, uh, you know, it's, it's for the good of people. Who, 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 who people are, what people are they talking about? And just like you say, you know, money makes a lot of things happen that shouldn't happen because you have money, sometimes you can buy your way to where you wanna go. But when we're in a tier one county, um, like I say, poverty level, 22% or more African-Americans, uh, what, what are we gonna do? We keep fighting. Um, our commissioners seem to 
think that in Viva is, you know, as our good friends, um, they've done this and they've done that. Um, but still, go right there on Lebanon Church Road and talk to the people that are right there and see what in Viva has done for them. They talk about economic development. I could take that word and just throw it away because that's a word that's used to get them where they want to be. Oh, they're going to bring jobs. It's going to do this and, you know, economic development. We had even had um, our mayor on TV when we, they were talking about the Atlantic Coast Pipeline bringing jobs. He was on TV advertising for the pipeline. So when you got your mayor doing that, what, I mean, who, who do you have fighting for it? We don't, we don't have it. So we have to stick together. And I know coming together will make things happen. Um, and I know we're not talking about the pipeline, but I would use that for an example. We had West Virginia, Virginia, North Carolina to come together and we stood and we fought and we stood and we fought. And um, on 20 last year, they said that the pipeline had been stopped. So if we keep coming together as we are coming together, because numbers count, and if we keep fighting and keep supporting one another, even though you're across the sea and I'm across the sea, but communication will bring us together. These webinars, these Zoom meetings will bring us together. We're fighting for the same cause. And even though it's not an overnight fix, it took us six years to get rid of the pipeline, but we did. So please don't give up. Whatever you do, keep fighting. Because I'm 68 years old. There's a younger generation that's coming behind me. Somebody needs to stand. And this is what we have to do for one another. We have to stand together. We have to fight for the same cause that what we believe in. And despite what people say, we can't give up because that's what they want us to do. They feel like the longer they make us fight against each other, then you know they're winning. But I'm claiming victory. I'm claiming jubilee. This is a year of change. Last year, some things changed. I'm looking for more change. And I just thank God for all of you and I, you know, whatever part that I can play, whatever I can do, then this is what I'm willing to do. I absolutely agree. You're a great inspiration, Belinda. Thank you so much. And we're now going to move on to hear about the link between the UK biomass industry and Canada, especially between Drax. And we're delighted that Michelle Connolly is with us from the environmental organization Conservation North, which is made up of volunteers and they're doing incredible work to protect forests in Canada. Michelle, it's wonderful to have you with us here tonight. Thank you so much. And it's actually morning for you, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Sally. Um, I'm, I'm shaking with rage right now about everything Belinda just said. And, and of course, Lena's words about what's happening in Estonia. It's an honor to present alongside both of you. Um, and I'm gonna talk about what's happening here. I'm with a community group called Conservation North. We, we're all volunteers and most of us have backgrounds in the sciences and um, our whole steering committee is, is, is women. So we advocate on behalf of nature in Northern British Columbia and we all live and work in the, in the territory of the Clayton Tene Nation who have been here for 10,000 years. The dot on the map shows where we live and work. I wanna talk about what Drax is doing to our forests here in Northern BC. I'm also gonna talk about who is enabling it and how they're doing that. So commercial logging has been happening in this part of BC for about 120 years. This is, this is lumberjack land, but the reality on the ground, unfortunately bears little resemblance to Monty Python's representation of logging life or the RCMP 40 years ago. So 60 years of, of that period has been uh, logging at industrial scales and rates. The forests lost over this period have gone to dimensional lumber, which is what's used in house construction and pulp, which is what gets turned into paper. And about 95% of what's logged in this part of BC is primary forest. And this is what modern industrial forestry looks like here. So primary forest is forest that's never been industrially logged before. This includes old growth forest, burned forests and beetle killed forests. Natural forests recover from disturbances like these, which we get a lot of in this part of BC. And we only have about 18% of Earth's original or primary forests left. And they're getting replaced with plantations that look a lot like this. Industrial logging has really hammered our forests in BC. This is a snapshot of the center of BC. It shows in red areas that have been industrially um, logged and roaded and in green primary forest or forests that have never been industrially logged before. So they're natural forests. What's miraculous is that despite the impacts of industrial development, 
uh, we, we still have all our pre-contact large bodied animals like these animals. I could talk for a whole hour about the wildlife and the special creatures that we have in this part of BC, um, but that's probably for another presentation. So last summer, we were astounded to come across flagging indicating that an area of primary forest quite near to us here was slated to be logged by a pellet company. This is a bird's eye view of the area on the right. So we went to the media, we got on the radio, we got on TV. Um, the area was scheduled for logging last winter, but Pacific Bioenergy has chosen not to log it for now. So thank you to Pacific Bioenergy for not logging this area, it means we have a window of time to protect it for the long term. We came across that area pretty much by chance when we were exploring, but when we looked seriously about what the publicly available data were saying, we discovered that the BC government is issuing licenses all over central and northern BC for pellet companies to log, and some of these licenses go back 15 years. I wasn't able to find out how long Pinnacle Renewable Energy has had operations in BC, but they have five plants that are all within three hour drives from where I am right now. They locate their plants along all the major rail lines so that they can move the pellets to shipping terminals for transportation overseas. They are, um, Pinnacle is BC's largest pellet producer and the world's second biggest pellet producer. So five, whoops, so five months ago, um, Drax bought Pinnacle and, and now have ownership interest in 10 pellet plants in Western Canada. So a few weeks ago, we out, went out with a videographer to capture what's happening in the forests west of us. So this is a preview that, of a video that we'll be releasing this fall. It shows Pinnacle cut blocks, a nearby pellet plant, and the forests here. So um, that video showed not only the kinds of natural forests that are being logged, but how they're being logged and the pellet plant nearest to where those cut blocks are um, to ship all these products overseas. So what's happening? Who's in charge here? Well, the Wood Pellet Association of Canada is having their conference and their annual general meeting on Monday. Um, and Pinnacle Senior Vice President, or Pinnacle Drax's Senior Vice President is doing opening remarks with our own BC Minister of Forests, Katrine Conroy. Um, at the last year's Wood Pellet Association of Canada's conference, she stated that pellets reduce greenhouse gas emissions and increase carbon storage in our forests. Um, both those things are not true. So the minister recently did a trade mission to Japan where she told audiences that forestry in BC is sustainable and that pellets are clean and green. Last year, BC's chief forester, Diane Nichols, who's pictured here, who is responsible for determining timber harvest levels across BC, um, did, a, did a video saying, a promotional video for wood pellets saying that they're a good news story for BC forest and they're good for forest health. Um, and her mandate is to increase access to forests, uh, to wood pellet companies. Academics at BC, at British Columbia universities are jumping on board as well, as are well-heeled funding agencies, which seem to be uncritically shoveling funds towards projects that further increase access to primary forests of this industry. Um, Belinda made a comment about, you know, studies that show all sorts of things. Um, knowing about this has led me to really distrust a lot of their research that's going on. Uh, many academics are jumping on board with this because there's so much money behind it. 
The Forest Enhancement Society was created in BC about five years ago. And according to uh, an, an analyst with the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives, they have provided $4.37 million of public money directly to Pinnacle Renewable Energy, which is now owned by Drax. So how are they getting away with this? Well, they're doing it by wrapping the logging of primary forests in a green veneer. So they say things like biomass helps local communities and the forest industry respond to natural disasters. We're salvaging damaged forests to return areas to healthy, productive forest cover. We're advancing a circular bioeconomy. This conference happened a few months ago on the bioeconomy. Apparently, clear-cutting uh, natural forests for pellets is part of a circular bioeconomy. And then they talk about restoring forests. Um, BC, the government and industry is rebranding primary forests as waste, low value, residuals, damaged, fire prone, and they're simultaneously referring to the conversion of these forests into pellets as low carbon, clean energy, and green energy. And they're getting some traction. So we're currently watching in horror as the RCMP crackdown on, on the largest act of civil disobedience in Canadian history on Vancouver Island and Pachita and Dididat territory. A thousand people have been arrested by the RCMP for defending some of the last old growth forests here. Um, the, the RCMP right now are, are violently assaulting people. They're dragging women by their hair. They're pulling off their masks and spraying pepper spray right in their faces at close range. Um, and they're grabbing women, uh, women's bodies and assaulting people. So this is what's happening uh, while, the, while the province tries to wrap the logging of primary forest in, in a clean and green veneer. This is gonna sound weird to say, um, but it's true. The pellet industry is not responsible for most of the destruction of BC's primary forest to date. That distinction goes to companies like this who own some of the biggest lumber mills on earth. Um, but pellet mills are vacuums, uh, like Lena said, because they can take most woody things. So the industry will make short work of our remaining natural forest if we allow this to continue. So the time to get ahead of this is now. I first learned about the link between what's happening um, to some of our forests and Drax by reading this article by Ben Parfit. And um, I would definitely re uh, recommend that others read this article. So, um, the BC government has not publicly committed to sourcing biomass from primary forests. Um, BC government and industry people travel the world to sell a green veneer and a sustainable image to purchasers of forest products from BC. I, I don't even think it's possible for me to overstate how much of a whopper it is that BC's logging is sustainable. That is absolutely not true. Um, right now, BC and industry are testing public acceptance of this practice of logging primary forests for pellets, um, and they have not yet publicly committed to not using primary forests for this purpose. So we want to make a huge public relations problem for them. That's what our group is doing. Um, there is potentially infinite global demand for energy products, and our last primary forests and communities and nature should not have to pay the price for this. So thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was wonderful. And if you have any questions for Michelle, feel free to add them to the chat box so you can put up your hands. Um, uh, Linda? I would just like to ask Pris to do me a favor. I saw where someone said, how can we help or who can, who can we write? Can you put DEQ's address and DAQ's address in the chat box for me, um, Pris, if you don't mind? And uh, I would like for the people to write to them and ask them to take in the consideration of letting the impact the community have some say in their permitting process and not just Title V and saying that they're, you know, looking at things. We need to have a direct um, say so within in the permitting process and things that are going to affect our community. So if you could write the DEQ and DAQ, um, and the address will be in the chat and just say that communities that are impacted should have a direct say into whether or not this permitting should go on because there are other states that's taken into consideration to impact the community and letting them have a say in that permitting process. And that's the main thing is, you know, Raleigh giving them those permits to, you know, do and then they say, as long as they're in compliance with what the state said that they should be, they have to grant them that permit. So my question was then why have a public hearing if, you know, our input is not gonna be considered. And they said that um, 
that was to take into consideration um, what you know what we say, and then they do this what they call mapping. But I mean, you've been mapping for years, so when are we going to see some results from that map? And so, if you could write to DEQ and DAQ, um, which would be in the chat, and just tell them that, that you feel like the community that's impacted should have a say so in the permitting process before they grant those permits, a direct say so, not just a public hearing, but a direct say so. Thank you. Thank you so much, Belinda. As Belinda was highlighting there, there's a huge injustice with the biomass industry that communities who are worst affected get absolutely no say in what's happening to their forests and they're suffering this terrible noise, water, air pollution. And we've got a couple of questions for Michelle. Um, Michelle, can you remind us who's responsible for logging most of the Canadian forests if biomass is not the primary destructor? And our second question, is Canada adding an ecocide section to legislation? Thank you for the questions. Um, here, the, the government of British Columbia has jurisdiction over forests. And in BC, there is no legislation that I'm aware of that prevents ecocide or the destruction of nature. We don't even have standalone endangered species legislation in, in British Columbia. We're a very backwards province. Um, the other question was who's responsible for the primary forest logging. Uh, so I just put two examples on my slide. One of them is Canfor, which is a multinational corporation and Wes Fraser. There are other, uh, organized, other companies as well. And to find out who they are, you could visit the Council of Forest Industries website or COFI, C-O-F-I. And that is the lobbying organization for all these big companies. So most of those companies are the ones that are responsible for having basically destroyed much of BC's primary forests, including old growth. Thank you so much. And a huge concern we have now that Drax has bought Pinnacle is that Drax isn't just buying wood pellets from other companies and burning them. Drax is now producing its own wood pellets and it's planning to sell them around the world. So it's expanding its biomass industry, which is a huge threat to forests. And Belinda was telling us about some things that people in the US can do to help protect forests there. There are also some great things that we can do in the UK. And I'm just going to go over a few of them and share my screen. So how can we take action, especially here in the UK, but also around the world by joining together to protect forests and to challenge some of the greenwashing that's surrounding this biomass industry that's they're basically destroying forests and burning trees. And it's especially important here in the UK because it came out last week that Drax has been having a lot of private meetings with the UK government ministers. Drax already gets over two million pounds every single day in renewable subsidies. And it's these subsidies that are fueling the biomass industry. And we really need to take these subsidies away from companies like Drax. And a key way that we can take action is especially by mobilizing before COP26. The eyes of the world are currently on the UK as we prepare to host COP26. And this is a vital time for us to put pressure on our politicians and tell them to stop funding false solutions like the biomass industry and to take action to protect our forests that we desperately need to reduce the impact of the climate crisis. And a key way that we can take action is by supporting campaigns like the Cut Carbon Not Forest campaign, which is calling on UK politicians to help transfer over one billion pounds in UK renewable subsidies from biomass burning to genuinely renewable wind and solar power. And we have a petition that you can sign and we'd love it if you'd like to sign and share it as widely as possible. We're going to be handing this petition into the UK government and we're asking them to stop subsidizing the burning of trees for energy. And Dorian will put that link in the chat box in a moment or two as well. Another way that you can take action to help protect forests around the world is by getting involved in biofuel watches actions. We have regular online actions and when it's safe with COVID, we also have in-person actions. These are pictures from Drax's AGM in April when amazing people all across the UK and around the world took photos saying we should axe Drax and save trees. And 
we, they also had messages saying forests are not fuel. And if you'd like to find out about any upcoming actions, we've got some online actions coming up very soon. You can join our mailing list with this get updates link and we can tell you all the things that are coming up. Another area that you might hear about, especially at COP26, is what's called bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. Now, this is Drax's latest plan to get money. Drax is basically saying that it can become the world's first carbon negative power station. And what it's claiming is that it can add some technology to the power station that will capture and store the carbon dioxide it emits. It's planning to build a huge new pipeline under the North Sea to store the carbon. And it's asking the UK government for enormous new subsidies to build this carbon capture and storage technology. What it's not telling people is that the bioenergy with carbon capture and storage technology is completely unproven. Drax admitted earlier this year in written answers to environmental campaigners that our bioenergy with carbon capture or BEX assumptions are not based on trials, it's just theory. Drax is also not admitting that it has not stored any of the carbon dioxide it emits. It's claiming it can store, a, it can capture one tonne per day, so it's aiming to capture 365 tonnes a year. So far, it has released all of the CO2 back into the atmosphere, and that was 13 million tonnes last year. So we're going to be organising a special webinar next month about why BEX or BioNG with carbon capture and storage is a dangerous false solution. And we think that's going to be on the 13th of October. We're just finalising the date. So it would be great if you'd like to come along and hear about that. And another way that you can take action is through the International Day of Action on Biomass, which is going to be the 21st of October. There will be actions happening all over the world online and we'll be all joining together to be stronger and call out this terrible industry that's destroying our forests. Biofuel Watch is also part of the Civil Society COP26 Coalition, which is campaigning for climate justice at COP26 and beyond. And we're going to be planning some online actions for COP26. And if it's safe, hopefully some in-person actions as well. So if you'd like to sign up for updates, we can let you know all the things that are happening. And a vital way that we can take action right now is by getting our MPs involved. We need our MPs to transfer these terrible subsidies away from biomass burning to genuinely renewable wind and solar power. And that's what we're doing with the Cut Carbon Not Forest campaign. And we'd love it if you'd like to contact your MP. By transferring the subsidies, we can not only protect forests around the world, we can help save wildlife, we can help communities who are suffering, and we can also help to create new green jobs in areas like wind and solar power. So there are so many benefits for transferring these subsidies. And there are different things our MPs could do to help. They could ask parliamentary questions in Westminster. They could write to the minister, the energy minister and the secretary of state who control the subsidies. And our MPs could help to meet the Cut Carbon Not Forest team who can give them lots more information. And this week is a really great time to contact your MPs about biomass subsidies because thousands of people are taking climate action for the Great Big Green Week and Climate Fringe. Mm. And we're having a special event on Monday. We're having a workshop with the wonderful climate charity Hope for the Future. This is a lunchtime training workshop at 12.30 UK time on Monday. And it's all about how we can build effective relationships with our MPs to talk to them about forest protection and encourage our MPs to take action to support forests and end these biomass subsidies. And I'm delighted that Laura Dehenen from Hope for the Future is with us here tonight. And Laura is going to tell us more about this workshop and how we can communicate effectively with our MPs about forests and climate issues. Thank you so much, Laura. Thanks, Sally. Um, and thank you for having me this evening. As Sally said, we've heard some really important and challenging things this evening. Hopefully we feel inspired to take action. Um, and here at Hope for the Future and myself, we believe that one of the biggest and most effective things we can do to take that action is to meet our politicians and work with them on these issues, which are really important to us and our local communities. 
but meeting our politicians, our MPs, our councillors, that can be sometimes daunting, it can sometimes be really difficult, and it can sometimes just be a task that we put to the bottom of our list because we're, you know, we're busy people. Um, yeah, we have a lot going on in our lives, but that's why we exist at Hope for the Future. Um, we are a UK-based climate charity, um, and over the past seven years, we've been working to equip communities, campaigners, groups all over the UK um, to communicate the climate emergency and these really pertinent issues within that theme with their local politicians. Um, and we've done seven years of research in how to do this effectively. Um, and now we have a proven track record of engaging with MPs across party lines on um, a whole host of climate related issues. As Sally mentioned, um, next week from Saturday is Great Big Green Week and Climate Fringe Week um, if you're in Scotland. Um, and that's a national week. So there's three, more than 3,000 events happening all over the UK, which is a huge number of events and something to really rally behind. Um, but also as part of that week, thousands of people all over the UK are also meeting with their MP. Um, so a really great time to, you know, get that action going on the issues which you're um, involved in and you're campaigning on. Um, there's a key message as part of the week, which is keep 1.5 alive. So 1.5 degrees, everything we need to do, all the policies, finances, green jobs um, that we need to do to, you know, keep our warming below one degrees. Um, as Sally said, we have a, men, um, a workshop on Monday, but I just wanted to let you know a bit more about Hope for the Future to give you a flavour of what that workshop might entail, um, and then I'll pop the link to sign up in the chat. Um, so why we do what we do at Hope for the Future is when we started our research um, seven, eight years ago, um, we realised that a lot of people you know, we're modeling their conversations with their politicians on what we see on the news, um, what we see on parliamentary question time, what we just see on, you know, the six o'clock, 10 o'clock news. Um, and often that can be quite confrontational and aggressive and adversarial. And what we were witnessing was conversation breakdown. So those conversations, those engagements with MPs, they just weren't going anywhere um, productive because the politician, the person who, you know, could take those actions to parliament was putting up their walls and they were, they were saying, well, I'm not getting anything out of this conversation. I'm just getting shouted at. So that's sort of where we came from um, in building our approach. And then our approach started to draw on Marshall Rosenberg's theory of nonviolent communication. Um, and that's really the foundation of now what we do, all the support that we offer for free across the United Kingdom. Um, and if you haven't read this book, highly recommend it. But basically, um, what Marshall says is that to communicate really effectively, we have to think about the needs of the person that we're communicating to in the hope that they'll consider our needs as well. Um, and this isn't just a uh, communication technique that we use with politicians. This is something we use in our day-to-day -day lives as well. Um, and it's based on the assumption that all human beings have the capacity for compassion and empathy. So to relate to that issue we really care about and people only resort to that harmful behavior, that aggressive behavior when they don't recognize a more effective strategy for meeting the needs of the other person. So our training workshop on Monday will talk about, you know, the understanding our MP as a human being and how we can really use that to our advantage to try and break down those barriers and really get them to take action on the issues that we care about. And one way we do that is through personalization and localization of all of the issues we encourage people to talk to their MPs about. Um, and I really love this quote, which is designing a presentation without your audience in mind is like writing a love letter and addressing it to whom it may concern. And what we're not asking you to do is write love letters to your MPs. But what Hope for the Future can help you do, can help anyone to do, is make that engagement with your MP as personal and as local as possible to really, you know, 
um, resonate with them and to make their ears prick up and to make them take that really tangible action that we want them to take. Um, and we know this, this works in practice. Um, and there's also a news article um, screenshot on, on the slide as well from Robert Halfen, a Conservative MP, who chimes with that same approach. He says, make it personal and make it local. To do that, a lot of research goes into making it personal and local. Um, and we are funded to offer that research into your MP. Um, and help you to tailor it to them, um, tailor your asks, tailor your conversation, so that you're going to get the most out of that conversation and leave the conversation feeling empowered and your MP has their actions to take away as well. Um, we'll be talking more about how we can do this research um, on Monday, but just so you know, um, as an organisation, we can offer what we call tailored lobbying strategies, where we do all the work for you, all the research into your MP, um, and give you a nice sort of three, four page document um, with everything you need to know about your MP and how best um, to engage and lobby with them. It's worth saying that a key um, part of our approach is common ground. Um, this isn't for everyone. Um, it, it can be hard to want to find common ground with our MPs, um, but here at Hope for the Future, we have seen, you know, that work really effectively, and I'll give you a, an example in a moment. Um, but why we do that is explained really simply in this graph. Um, so on the y-axis is our concern with reaching the goals. So um, what we're talking about tonight, industrial biomass, is, is, is the goals. And then the concern with the relationship on the x-axis. Um, and what we found that if we're too concerned with reaching those goals and we just, you know, have ask and ask and ask of our, um, our MPs, our politicians, we're going to reach a stalemate. Um, we're not going to, you know, achieve everything we'd like to achieve. Um, because our MP might start putting up their walls and saying, I'm not getting anything out of this relationship. Why should I carry on doing that for you? Especially, you know, as they're um, busy and managing lots of different asks from constituents. And then if we're too far along the x-axis concerned with the relationship, that's when we're going to be stepping on eggshells. We're going to be really worried about, you know, making our MP feel uncomfortable or, um, you know, and we're not going to be worried about meeting those goals. But where hope for the future works is this middle area um, where we have those really strong, tangible, concrete goals, the things we want to see, but we also help you to understand how to build a really effective relationship with your MP. So we want to be, you know, in that middle area. Um, I won't dwell on this slide, um, but essentially um, we have the campaigner agenda on the left and the um, your the MPs agenda on the right and then in the middle is where we want to be working you know those issues that are really going to push us forward with our MP um, and we can help you find common ground on the issues that you care about as well through framing um, and making it really relevant and personal to your MP as well and um, if it's okay I'll just finish on um, this case study um, and I, I hope it inspires you to come along to Monday's session. Um, this is a case study of Alex Chalk, MP for Cheltenham. Um, and we started supporting Alex Chalk's constituents back in uh, 2018. Um, and in the first meeting with Alex Chalk, um, he said he vigorously defended the government's climate change record. He said, we can't possibly be doing anything else. You know, we've got world leading policies. And he, he sort of said to his constituents, don't come back and speak to me about this. You know, I don't want to work for you on this topic. Um, but we went away and we started to do a bit more digging into Alex Chalk and, you know, what makes him tick as a human being. Um, and we found that he had this very, very distant relation to solar energy. Um, so he popped on an event, a local event about solar energy um, and... Alex came along to that and then he came along to the local school and heard the local school talk about climate change um, and all the policies they wanted to see happen locally. And every interaction we had with him was tailored to his own context, his constituency, his, you know, his career interests. 
um, and every meeting we sort of see, saw him shift in his views on, um, you know, the ambition we need to show um, as, as the UK. Um, firstly, he started to go on to submit parliamentary questions about climate change. And then Alex Chalk went on to propose the bill, which commits the UK to reaching net zero by 2050. Um, so the government went on to back that proposal. Obviously, we now have the net zero 2050 law um, enshrined. Um, and when he when that law got passed, Alex Chalk thanked his constituents of Cheltenham, the ones that hope for the future have been supporting, for raising climate change up his agenda and make, you know bringing it to his attention. Um, so I think it's a nice example of an, an MP we can see shift and that if you think I don't want to work for my MP because we have differing views, actually you can see real change. But it's also an example of, you know, we think everyone else is talking to our MPs about these issues when actually they're probably not. And I would really ask you today to think about um, taking, taking um, things to your MP that you, you're concerned about. So we'd love to see you at Monday's session. Um, as Sally said, it's 12.30 till 1.30. I'll pop the Eventbrite link in the chat. Um, share it around with your friends. Um, it'll be recorded um, and we'll have a really practical session. Um, it'll be four steps, four stages um, for having a really effective relationship with your MP. Um, so thank you all for having me um, and I will hopefully see you on Monday. That's absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much, Laura. John, would you like to ask a question? One very simple question. When are we going to go for the juggler? <laughs> we are living in a society which is ruled at the present time by governments who is the oldest party in the UK. One of the reasons why it's the oldest part in the UK is it gets financial aid from sponsors, mainly chemical, oil, industry, and now tracks. Politics is a numbers game. In Scotland at the present time, the Greens have joined with the SNP. I've got my reservation about that, but one thing they can do is that between the Greens and the SNP, they can force the Conservative Party to back down on issues. And more important, because this Conservative Party haven't gave the multinationals oil wells in the west of the Shetlands and coal from the Thumbria, the finances of the Conservative Party are not giving them money. So they're looking for finance. This is how to beat these multinationals. Support MSPs that are supporting your cause and have a look at the numbers game and go for it. As I say, in Scotland, my question is, how do you go, go about it? Well, one of the answers is to support the Greens coalition along the SNP on issues of the environment. Thank you so much, John. And as John was saying, we really need to get our politicians to stop taking money from these horrible companies and to actually act for the climate. And hopefully if you'd like to come along on Monday, that could be a great way to work out how we can build this very positive relationships with our MP. If you can't be here on Monday, we're going to be recording the session. So we'll also be sharing it. And we're just about out of time. So I wondered if our speakers could maybe say a closing word or two about what people here in the UK can do to help forests in your country. And maybe Lena, would you like to start? Um, after I finished, I saw uh, several questions about like replanting the trees in the chat. I answered them as well as I could, but as everybody perhaps did not read the chat, then I'll, uh, I'll repeat again that, uh, this is one of the favorite myths of the intensive logging industry to say, but we replant, we replace. But, well, trees are not carrots. It's not so that you sow new seeds next spring and everything is fine. Uh, it takes trees to mature 
at least in Estonia, more than 20 years. Um, in some cases, 40, mostly 60, 80 years. We have oaks which are 500 and more years old. So we are speaking about like, like really decades up from 50 to centuries. Um, so replacing, replanting, um, yeah, this, this is not an excuse. And uh, we'd also like to stress that you can't plant a forest, you can only plant trees and you can hope that it all evolves into a forest ecosystem finally. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Lina. And the best way that we can take action is to protect and restore our existing forests. And although planting trees is good, it's not, not the same as it protecting our existing forests. That's amazing, thank you. And Belinda, would you like to say a few closing words of what people can do to help? Uh, as again, I thank Chris for putting the DEQ um, website in, in, in the chat box. Um, and I think it's more or less uh, leaders that keep permitting these these companies to come here. Um, if we could just you know get some insight on them and let them know that this is not what we need. Um, there are other sources other than that. Um, and if they you know like I say, the only thing you just got to get your representatives to do what they're supposed to do. In other words. We're their constituents when they're running for office, but once they get there, they sort of kind of forget how they got there and, and we're kind of left out in the cold. So the only thing that I can say is to try to reach those that are that are in authority that can make these decisions or met, not make them. Mm. And if we can reach them and, you know, kind of get a grip on them, I think things would be much better. Thank you again for having me. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Belinda. And to finish off, Michelle, would you like to say a few words? Yes. Um, if you could pressure your government to not allow imported products that were derived from primary forests in British Columbia, that's the single most important thing that could happen. Um, and don't listen to industry and government when they lobby your leaders and say that B BC and Canada's forestry is sustainable. It absolutely isn't. It's not logging primary forest is, is not sustainable in any way, shape, or form. So we need to we need to stop logging those, and um, you can stop importing products of all kinds from that originate from those forests. Thank you so much. That's us out of time now, and I'd like to say a massive thank you to our wonderful speakers, to Lena, to Belinda, to Michelle, and to Laura, and a huge thank you to everybody here tonight. This is the Eventbrite link if you'd like to come along on Monday and we'll also be recording it if you'd like to see it at another time and we'll be sending out a video of tonight's event and also some of the links that were in the chat box. So a massive, massive thank you to, for coming this evening and we hope that we will be seeing you again soon. Thank you very much. <laughs>